Cinema Classics is brought to you by the Gateway Film Center, 1550 North High Street. Further details and showtimes online at gatewayfilmcenter.com. The award-winning Cinema Classics is produced by John DeSando and Johnny DiLoretto. Listen to the shows online at wcbe.org. I'm John DeSando. And I'm Johnny DiLoretto. And this is... Cinema Classics. Cinema Classics. We are at the Gateway Film Center. We are. And uh, something very exciting that happens here every year, John, is our celebration of Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, we call it Hitchcocktober. We yep. rename the whole month of October. And this year, a twist even the master <laughs> would appreciate. Yeah. We are partnering up with Studio uh, 35 Cinema and Draft House in Clintonville. They are actually going to launch this year's Hitchcocktober on October 1st with a screening of Vertigo, which many, it's a one time only screening. The whole celebration kicks off there. Uh, Vertigo, as you know, uh, is well, now at the top of the list. Has displaced Citizen Kane. Yeah, that's that's the correct. greatest film it ever. Can't be. It's, but it's a, tr it's a true thing. It'll spin our audience around to know that it's starting at Studio Thirty Five yeah. and then coming back over here. And then the very next day, on October second, uh, the film comes back home to the uh, Gateway Film Center for North by Northwest. And you know we have all month long different Hitchcock films. Uh, North by Northwest, The Birds, uh, Rear Window, culminating with Psycho, and Studio 35 has one more screening of Strangers on a Train on October 15th. Look it. Yeah. You can't get better Hitchcock maybe than Topaz. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys oh, yeah. are smart enough to pick the best ones. And you know, my favorite is The Birds. Is it? That's oh, your yeah. favorite one? That's my favorite one. Really? Yeah. Why uh, is and that? we've talked about it, and I'll tell you, the imagery on that one... The stark, crisp shots with the most, Im uh, the one that most impressed me of the birds on the wire. Yeah. As we start with one bird. Right. And then you move on. And, she and keeps glancing back. <laughs> and there are more birds, and I can't look at a bird on a wire without thinking And it is really great, that, that scene in particular, because as you have pointed out before, that here, filled with menace, is this thing that we usually look upon with, you know, a light heart, or you know, this we look at, on it as a thing of beauty, uh, and it does take on this really yeah. kind of uh, sinister uh, tone. Um, that's interesting. So, here's the question I, I want to pose to you: Is every year Hitchcocktober is one of our most successful endeavors at the Gateway Film Center? Uh, audiences turn out in droves to see these films. Younger people, older people, but you know. That core demographic is here. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious because these aren't necessarily people who are, you know, movie nerds. They're not like necessarily steeped in cinema culture, but they return year in and year out. And I wonder what you think. What is the allure of these films to a younger audience these days? Why do people keep coming? Well, first of all, and most superficially, that guy is the most noticeable, recognizable director in the history of cinema. Mm. And I think he crafted a persona, both he's, on television and film. He's looking right at me. <laughs> I know he is. Kind of unsettling. Right? So that even younger audiences can say, oh, I know who that is. I know Hitchcock. So they're, they're kind of drawn to it by the fact that these, there's somebody they, they know, they okay. can actually say as a director, but they need to know more about his film. So it's like he is an in to classic cinema. Actually. Okay, that's interesting. At one point he was the best director in Great Britain before he became a U.S. Yeah, citizen. Sure. Yeah. Well, a, a theory that I have is that his wit, his wry sense of humor, yeah. and his sort of dark, you know, bent yes, that runs through all these films, yeah. I think that it allows these audiences, you know, one of my pet peeves are when younger audiences look at classic movies and they can't make the necessary temporal or cultural adjustments. Uh, and so they laugh at anachronisms or they laugh at things that they find things corny, you know, uh, instead of buying in to the movie. I think Hitchcock kind of walks this fine line where there's a, there's a sort of irony afoot in a lot of these movies that allows these audiences I, to I think you're right. absolutely right on. And he, that persona that I talked about, that kind of bulbous, would appear to be jolly, even though he wasn't by nature a yeah. jolly man, uh, 
was was the way of getting into his deep kind of misanthropy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> and uh, and of course his attitude toward women is so apparent on here. His icy blondes, uh, you know, his own fixation in his life. Uh, you know, so there are things that swirl around this. Yeah. That you're talking maybe about. that's another thing you you might have just hit on the misanthropy. Uh, maybe that also sort of acts as a buffer against these more sort of what you know contemporary audiences would look on as corny or right, right. old fashioned that that you know loathing of human beings uh, kind of you know gives them a remove. Oh yeah, I mean you you wouldn't say he loved Jimmy Stewart. No, no, uh, or Cary Grant. Yeah, I don't feel a warmth there. He just knows guys that look good and can act well. But he's also very smartly plugging those guys into roles in which, when they bring their cinematic baggage, is going to only give that part more depth. It's only going to give yes. it more nuance, and it's going to be packed to the gills with psychological ramifications. So, for instance, when you take Jimmy Stewart, who, at the time in the 50s, you know, uh, when he was cast in Vertigo and Rear Window and Rogue, which was 1948 actually, but um, he had he'd come back from the war, he had made it a wonderful life, he had made a name for himself in westerns, and so he did have that kind of all-American, you know, charm yep. about him and folksiness. Uh, so when Hitchcock casts him as this wheelchair-bound pervert, it's, you know, it's communicating, it's, it's in a constant dialogue with what you think of right. as Jimmy Stewart. And he's playing Stewart against type, which is really great. Well, I just said that. Yeah. That's good. All right, I can cut that out. That is, in much fewer words. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I was trying to do. Oh, well, thank you. Nice. <laughs> the flattering one. Yes, cast against type. That's what he did. <laughs> the, another thing is, he's... He's a master of suspense. Everybody knows that. It's yeah. a cliche. But he withholds information so beautifully, better than any filmmaker today can do. We've grown so sophisticated, we can anticipate what's going to happen. Right. But Hitchcock at that time, you couldn't really anticipate it. He played with you. Yeah. The cat with the, uh, you know, with the cat and And right. then he springs it on you. So I think that, listen, I think you're right. I think that, you know, at a time when uh, most people were looking to Rage the audience or please the audience. Right, yeah. Hitchcock saw the value in antagonizing the audience, undermining their expectations, uh, perverting their desires uh, to great effect. Well, you mentioned too the underlying psychological elements. And if you take the best example of the cycle, the relationship between him and his mother, yeah. you know, Troy would have been fed up. Yeah, Hitchcock in it there, but it looks like just a you know a really top grade horror film. But he's saying so much more about the relationship between a son and a mother, and uh, and so well, you think know, of the ramifications of Psycho. I mean, you know, you had classic monster movies. You know, in the '30s, you had your Universal monsters, and then in the '50s, you had your sci-fi monsters and your Creature of Black Lagoon. So you had monsters. Uh, Psycho represents the first real human monster uh, representing the horror genre. I mean, that changed everything. Then from there on, that's where you get stuff like Texas Chainsaw, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Halloween, Fred, Friday the 13th. You know, when Hitchcock really, you know, it's kind of, he did uh, to human beings what he did with the birds. <laughs> you know what I mean? He turned them into monsters. Okay. And he was able to get down there too and give us stuff that we'll never forget. For instance, the MacGuffin concept. Mm -hmm. Now, back when Orson Welles was doing um, Citizen Kane, and he had Rosebud, which yeah. was really not central to it. It was mm -hmm. it was a part of the film, but it wasn't at all what Welles was doing. Right. It was an idea that you chased around, <laughs> right. and in order to be exposed to different characterizations. So Hitchcock again plays with us by having MacGuffins in his film, things that people are looking for. I think North by Northwest, it was the the, 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 the pouch with the, the plans or something in it. You know, it's not that <laughs> mean a <laughs> thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Let's talk about Cary Grant for a second, because, you, you know, yeah. we talked about how effective it was to cast Jimmy Stewart against type. Yes. Uh, Cary Grant, 
he's playing with Cary Grant's image in North by Northwest. Um, you know, al almost his um, the image that he projected in the classic screwball comedies, where Cary Grant is this tremendously debonair, handsome dude, but he's also kind of a schmuck. You know, and uh, Hitch is playing with that, but in a di in a road movie sort of adventure espionage setting. Yeah, right, and it's it's wonderful that you say that because. Um, Cary Grant was everything that any man looking at the film wanted to be. He wanted to look like, he wanted to be as cool and so on. And Hitch plays with us by putting him in real danger because, as you say, he is a schmuck. He's screwing up. Yeah. You know, and they think he's a spy when he's just an advertising man. And so we are all where we couldn't say that we're anywhere close, except you, to, uh, to Cary Grant's suaveness and his handsomeness. What we can do, however, is identify with him screwing up along the way. Right. <laughs> I well, I think that was the secret to <laughs> Cary Grant's success all along, well, was that yeah. he was more than what he looked like. Yeah. He, wasn't, he wasn't quite as slick and put together <laughs> as the figure he cut. <laughs> now, good. what's interesting, in To Catch a Thief, which is not playing in this series, yeah. um, Cary Grant is cast as sort of Cary Grant. <laughs> That's right. You know, the ideal Cary Grant. That's right. Uh, that's right. And maybe that's why that film is not as well thought of or remembered or Yeah, yeah, they could be. You know. But you know, it comes back down to it, which is something that I always admire, is casting. And how how he knew I mean what what's what's her name in, in uh uh Rear Window? Oh Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly. Mm -hmm. This Ice Princess, how perfect. Beautiful, sweet, charming, uh, but a danger. The Jimmy Stewart character. I mean, yeah. I love. The, how did he know that she would be so good at it? How do you know Stewart and and Grant would be so perfect? I don't know. I know, but, but that is the genius. Now, as we're probably getting close to the end here. Yeah. This is your editor speaking. Right. <laughs> Can you tell me uh -huh. your favorite Hitchcock and why? Oh wow, that is that is great. Um, my favorite Hitchcock film is probably, uh, I think, Rear Window. Yeah, I would think uh, that. I, I think Rear Window, one, because Jimmy Stewart is, you know, uh, I think the greatest American screen actor. Um, I love the film's sense of place, and I love that you're watching a movie that is essentially about watching movies. Oh, great, yeah. And But never hitting you over the head with that, and it's just this little... I don't know, like, uh, it's almost like a, what is that, a matryoshka doll, you know, like mm. you keep opening yes. these little things, there's more and more in there. Um, I love that. I love that movie for that reason. You know, you look out into that backyard and out of that rear window, and there are all these stories. And that's movie making. Mm -hmm. That's Hitch playing with us again. Yeah. And you're, and, and of course, what you're, you're, you're talking about here is that which I think he perfected, which was the point of view shot. Yeah. I mean, he actually placed us right there in Jimmy Stewart's eyes. Also knew how to do filmic things that elevated a scene or a moment uh, to something beyond what we think of as cinema doing. Like, you know, I often think of the effects that Scorsese did, like, you know, right when he was a rapid fire cut with a little slow motion in it or something like that to kind of elevate the thing. Remember the kiss that happens between Jimmy Stewart and Grace Kelly in Rear Window, and it almost—it's slow motion, but it's almost vibrating uh, when they, you know, the, it cuts to that close-up, and they're coming together, and the screen is—I don't know what it's doing, but it's like—it's pulsating. Yeah. And um, it's things like that. Oh boy. Well, if you don't believe us, come enjoy all these Hitchcock films for yourself. Don't forget first one uh, is at Studio 35 and then again on the 15th but for the better part of the series it's right here at the Gateway Film Center. And don't blame us if you get scared to death. <laughs>